Most of my career has been spent uh, studying the basic brain mechanisms of attention. But around uh, 2003 or so, uh, as a professor, as a assist assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, having just had a small child, teaching a full load, and uh, you know running the lab, I basically was at my end in terms of stress. And it was sort of this uh, defining moment where I had uh, essentially lost feeling in my teeth from grinding them um, and had to give a talk at a faculty retreat about all the work that we were doing in my lab and I was actually you know things were happening but I couldn't talk and to me that was like um, hmm maybe I need to pay attention to what's going on here at this around the same time um, Richie Davidson had actually been giving a talk was giving a talk at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, at, and I was already feeling kind of the stress and strain, having a, a one-year-old at the time, and you know, it was a, it was a tough time. Uh, he showed these, the picture of a, of a basically uh, electrical profile, topographical voltage map, of what he said was a br of the brain uh, image of somebody who had been induced to be in a negative mood. And it had a particular asymmet asymmetry. Next to it, he had another profile of a brain of a person that was in a positive mood. So we had negative on one side, positive on the other. And after the whole talk was over, I raised my hand in front of, you know, maybe two, three hundred people and said, earlier in the talk, you showed a negative and a positive brain next to each other. They're obviously different from each other. My question is, how do you get that negative one to look positive? And it was sort of the end of the question and answer session. And he just looked up and he said, meditation. And that was it. And I was sort of like, we can't, we can't say that word. I mean, you're at Penn, okay? But it stuck in my head, and when this moment happened, I was like, I gotta try something. First thing I did is mumble to my husband, I'm gonna quit my job, like, I, don't, I can't do this anymore, I'm miserable. Then I thought, and he very kindly suggested, maybe we could think about this a little bit, the summer's coming up, so I basically that summer ended up uh, going to the bookstore and picking up a book on mindfulness meditation for beginners by Jack Kornfield and committed to doing the practices in that book, and it changed everything about my own experience. Um, and really it was like a flash going off in my mind where I was like, oh my goodness, not only do I feel better, but this is something to do with my attention. I mean, all the instructions were around attention. I know a lot about attention. I'm gonna study this. And it was almost like feeling compelled. Like I, I'm not gonna be able to do anything but wanna study this. And um, I've kind of felt like, you know, I'm really fortunate because I know how to do all this stuff, but now I have a purpose for how I can apply it. Wrote my first grant the following semester, got that grant, and then kind of haven't stopped studying this intersection between the basic brain mechanisms of attention and contemplative practices impact on potentially improving those functions. Well, we, we're so early in wanting to track how different kind of high performance, high stress groups um, benefit from, or if they benefit at all, from mindfulness meditation in particular. So I don't have a good answer for your question yet, but what I can tell you is the motivation behind wanting to do it is they do share a lot of features of their stress level. And for some of these groups, we can even predict what the psych cyclic nature of their stress is going to be. Right. So for a student, at the beginning versus the end of the semester, stress levels increase, attention decreases. In the military context, as they're preparing for deployment, attention decreases, stress levels increase. Then deployment itself is a whole other story. So for the business and sports context, it was a similar kind of thing. So my question was, and just as it's a more basic question around the role of improving attention in the, in the service of resilience, um, was how might we offer mindfulness training to people in that interval as they're, uh, sorry, to protect against the kind of onslaught of the degradation they're likely to experience. Can we bolster up the resources at risk for degrading over a high stress period of time? And in my mind, that is gonna be a key aspect of promoting resilience in people. So it, whereas I would say the bulk of the field of resilience is looking at coping mechanisms or social support or individual differences in just their own kind of intrinsic resilience, I'm taking more of a kind of a cognitive or cognitive training approach and saying, how do we get those things that are at risk for declining to stay, uh, stay strong? We did a study with incarcerated youth that was in collaboration with uh, people at NYU, uh, the School of Nursing, uh, 
Noelle Leonard was the first author on it, and she was already very interested in providing mindfulness uh, programs for youth with this knowledge that as people enter, as these children enter the juvenile justice system, the very thing we're trying to get them to be better at, their own ability to control their emotions, making better decisions, may be at risk for being more compromised by just having entered that system. That to me is, a, is, is horrible. It's like not only are we, are we gonna take them out of uh, society, but then instead of bolstering them, we're degrading them and then kind of putting them back out there. So I was very interested in seeing if the kinds of attentional measures that we look at, um, you know, what, how does the program that they were offering track attention? And what we found was, I think, very interesting, which is when you compare the sort of treatment as usual, um, and there are many treatments, which I was happy to hear, that there is an intention to help children um, who are in these circumstances, because they're high, high risk youth, you know, before they got into the system. Um, when you compare those treatment usual, as usual kind of options to a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy program, you can see differences. And, but the most striking thing was that the treatment as usual group declined over the period of time that they were incarcerated. The group that got the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy actually didn't. And within that group, the people that, the children that practiced above and beyond the kind of minimum amount that they got as a group actually got a little bit better. So that gave me a real sense of hopefulness that you know this this type of training can actually even in the same context as other people you know that other people are experiencing that is causing them to decline may grow the resources that they need. Absolutely. I mean, that's my strong hunch. And if you know of the group, the Holistic Life Foundation, uh, that's the kind of work that they're doing. You know, they, uh, we've been trying to figure out a way to pair up to actually track their their work. I mean, there's some good studies that they've already been doing uh, with folks at Johns Hopkins, but um, that's the intention, is that you don't have to wait for people to kind of decline to the point where they're in the juvenile justice system before you can actually uh, help. Yeah, wisdom is a hard construct, um, but I would say that definitely part of what contemplative practice offers is this ability to reflect and know how we behave, what our tendencies are, and even what used to be unconscious becomes more conscious, consciously available to us. And in some sense, I would say, if you think about wisdom as sort of the, the trajectory of learning about who we are and how we relate to the world, that improves through the course of, of engaging in these, in, in these practices. Um, when I think about the kind of work that I do in my lab, uh, the intention is to take, and, take in the sense of benefit from the world's wisdom traditions and figure out how to offer those to people in a secular fashion. So the, question is, well, what's the, what is, what's, what are you leaving out, right? So what, what aspect of that is the thing that you're not going to say is part of the secular uh, practice? And it's essentially any kind of overarching belief system or worldview that we're not incorporating into what we're offering. So the practices themselves actually end up being quite accessible to people. Um, and, and things like the breath or um, paying attention to your body or body scans uh, or thinking about kindness and connection are not the, the, the terrain of any particular tradition. So when I think about r religious practices, I would say that what we're trying to, what we're doing, maybe uh, not even intentionally, is kind of extracting out the common elements across many different traditions and then bringing them to the laboratory to see how they change the way the brain works and, and how attention works. I think that one thing that's really important to keep in mind as we, as we think about wisdom uh, is to make sure that it is applied in the real world. I mean, we've got a planet that has you know, seven billion people on it. And if it's left, if wisdom and wisdom practices are esoteric and only for the few, 
we will never benefit from the world's wisdom traditions. So part of what I see my role and my passion as doing is benefiting and sort of almost translating into a way that might be more acceptable and accessible to people by, by actually applying the scientific lens to wisdom practices. And I think that is something that I would want to encourage more scientists to do, especially in the contemplative neurosciences, is to shore for the purposes of, of understanding brain mechanisms of esoteric practices. It's very interesting, but that's only one part of the picture. And the real benefit of the world's wisdom traditions is to help the world become more wise.